Hi, I'm Dr. Gregory Keller, Jacksonville Orthopedic Institute, and I'm going to take the next few minutes to show you a fairly simple but comprehensive low back examination. This is something I've used for the last 15 years and it served me well and I think you'll find it helpful. I have a volunteer here from the clinic that's going to help us with this. And I'm going to narrate as I go along, so it will probably take more than the five minutes advertised, but if you take out the narration and the additives, I think you'll understand it can be done fairly easily. So the first thing is to get an overall impression of the patient. Generally, how they're sitting, whether they're comfortable or in obvious pain makes a big difference. Um, this patient, this example is an obvious, no, no obvious discomfort. He seems comfortable. Uh, and then after introducing myself, I will ask them a little history about their pain. A lot of that I will have already gotten before I even come in the room. But once they've explained that to me, the time course of this, then we can go straight to the exam. Generally, I will start this by having them stand up. And then I'll have them turn and face away from me. And then I can examine their back directly. The things I'm looking for here first is symmetry. I'm looking to see if there's any asymmetry or asymmetric skin folds. I could put my hands on their hips to see if those are level, because if they're not, that can give me a hint that they might have a leg length inequality that could contribute to their back pain. I can check their chest expansion, take a deep breath. If it expands less than an inch, they could have early stiffening of their spine or ankylosing spondylitis. Then I can have them go through a range of motion, bend forward for me. Let your hands hang down. Now you can measure this by just seeing how close their hands get to the floor. Most men with tight hamstrings will not be able to touch their toes and that's really not that important. What is more important is looking at the curvature of their back while they're bent over. If they have a scoliosis, you'll oftentimes see an asymmetry where the one side will be higher than the other. Sometimes you can even see the spinous processes curving. Then I'll have them recover or stand back up. That's important because people with a lot of back pain will have difficult time doing that. Sometimes they will lift themselves up with their hands. Sometimes they'll sway their back trying to recover. We're often asked about spasm. I find it very difficult to assess spasm, and fortunately, few patients present with it, but I'll palpate their back muscles, and those muscles are very hard. That's indicative of spasm, and his are not. Turn back around. Then I'll ask him to walk. Take a few steps, if you would, toward the door and come back, please. Just normally. A normal gait should not obviously have any kind of limp. Uh, he doesn't. You can also look at their legs during this part to see if there's any asymmetry as far as size is concerned. Then I'll have them walk away from me on their toes. Heels up. Lift your heels, take a walk to the door, and then stop when you get there and turn around. During that, you can tell that his calf muscles are symmetric and strong. He can lift himself equally on both sides. And this will come in handy later in some patients who are somewhat inconsistent. We're going to test the same strength later on in the exam, but this gives us a good back check. And now I ask you to walk over there and turn around and come back to me, but this time on your heels. Keep your toes off the floor. This is a great test for the function of the L5 nerve root specifically. Uh, because if they can't do this on one side or the other, it gives you a clue that they might have involvement of that particular nerve root. Thank you very much. Have a seat up here. Now once I have them sitting, and I generally do my neurology exam with them sitting. You can do it with them lying supine as well, but it takes a little more time and it's a little harder on the physician. But with them sitting, I can start out by listing their reflexes. Now most people, including this volunteer, the reflexes are fairly easy to elicit. We'll check their knee reflexes to obviously check the function of the L3 and the L4 nerve root, and then their ankle reflex to check S1. And he has a easily elicited a reflex at both locations. If it's harder to get, you can have them put their hands together like this and then pull. That distracts them a little bit, so in someone who's hard to get a reflex from, that can help. Get rest. Then while I've got their legs down here, I'll go through a motor exam. And again, we've already tested this to a certain degree by having them toe walk, but I'll ask them to push down on the gas for me. Push down hard. Good. Now pull up. Pull that heel up. That's good. See, that tested the same thing. I had him heel walking. Now I can have him lift his foot and retest that. In addition, I'll have him bring that great toe up. Bring the great toe up. Hold that. 
that's a little different. You might miss that on the heel walking exam, but if he can't bring that toe up, you've got to be suspicious of an L5 involvement, whereas L4 helps innervate that muscle so it can cover for on the heel walking test. Same thing over here. I'm looking for symmetry. Down, up, raise the great toe. Good, good. If it's in a patient whom I suspect might have a vascular condition as well or mimicking this, I'll check for a dorsalis pedis pulse. Readily palpable on this volunteer. You can feel that right there on both feet and you can compare that. And if they're palpable, you really don't have to worry about a vascular issue or have a vascular exam done. And then finally, sensation. As everyone knows, each nerve root goes to a particular part of the leg called the dermatome and you can measure that or assess that sensation by just, I just do a light finger testing. You feel me touching you there? Yes, sir. Up here? Yes, sir. And in there? Yes, sir. And then in the legs? Yes, sir. Both? And then finally, I'll do a range of motion of his hips because it surprised you how often people present with what is believed to be back pain but really have hip disease that mimics that, especially when they have the thigh pain that goes with severe hip disease. This is a good, easy way to bring that out. In addition, even though that's not the focus of today's talk, I'll get an x-ray of their hips at the same time that I x-ray their back, and I'll get a double check on their hips. And finally, I like to assess patient for straight leg raising or tension on the nerve root. This often accompanies a nerve being pinched by a disc herniation. And classically, this is done with the patient's supine, but I find that it actually is helpful to do it while they're sitting. And we call this the flip back test. As I raise this leg up, that will put tension on that nerve root if that patient has a disc herniation pushing it, the nerve root away. And I can even further tension it by bringing the foot up in dorsiflexion. And then I'll repeat that on both sides since in the central disc herniation, you can have pain with the opposite leg being straightened. And that concludes a normal back exam. Now you've seen a normal exam, and now we're going to show you some abnormalities that are frequently seen on exam. The first, and probably the most famous, is a foot drop, oftentimes called drop foot by my patients, but we actually call it a foot drop. And he'll show you this is the involvement of the L5 and to a lesser extent the L4 nerve root when the patient cannot dorsiflex their foot against resistance or the weight of their body. So walk for me showing me a foot drop on the left. See how his foot slaps the floor with each step? He cannot ease that left foot down. And you'll often heel, hear a slap of that foot as it hits the ground. Another common weakness is weakness of the calf involving the S1 nerve root. So when you have the patient walk on their toes, they're unable to do so. Show us, walk on your toes or try to. See how his heel drops with every step? That's weakness of the calf. Two ways of recovery that are pathologic include the sway back recovery that he's demonstrating now, and the other is when they lift themselves up on their hands, as he'll show you. Both of these indicate weakness of the back muscles, which oftentimes goes with back pain. An abnormal straight leg raising test will be when the patient grimaces or tells me he's having pain in the back of the leg when I straighten the leg out causing sciatic symptoms or leaning back to get away from me, take, trying to take the tension off his nerve by straightening that line. One thing we're always concerned about is a patient who magnifies their symptoms. And there are a lot of things to look for to, to give evidence of this. Uh, Waddell described a number of these back in the 80s quite well, but the most useful to me is tenderness to palpation, even light palpation. So when I'm examining the patient's back, if he grimaces or shows a lot of pain behavior with a light palpation, that's clearly abnormal and there's no organic explanation for that, barring a skin rash or something creating sensitivity. Thank you.